So I wanted to make this talk applicable to my experience uh, here so far, but I made the title of the, the talk before I actually made the slide. So really, uh, instead of talking about the operative nuances and techniques of these tumors, we're going to talk more about some of the newer molecular characteristics uh, underlying these tumors, as this is becoming ever more important in the treatment of these diseases. So these are the tumors that we'll go over. Uh, really, for vestibular schwannomas, I'll give more of a historical context starting with Harvey Cushing. Uh, and then if at, at the end, if there's time, we'll go over some operative anatomy. So when we talk about these tumors, uh, we're really talking about these, the majority of them are histologically non-malignant. And of those non-malignant tumors uh, of the CNS, a majority of them are meningiomas, 25% involved the pituitary, and then around 10 to 12% involve peripheral nerve sheaths or vestibular schwannomas. And then around 1% are really the mesenchymal tumors, the chordomas and the chondrosarcomas that we, we talk a lot about, but they're essentially, they're very rare. And so we'll start with chordomas and chondrosarcomas. And so chondrosarcomas, these are mesenchymal tumors with cartilaginous differentiations. And there's really two subtypes, conventional and mesenchymal. A majority of them are sporadic. And interestingly, they harbor the same IDH mutations that are seen in gliomas. Now, the location of these tumors is really related to the osseous development of the, uh, of the cranium compared to the, the skull base. And so the, the cranium really develops by intramembranous ossification compared to the skull base, which develops by endochondral ossification. And so during the skull base development, you can get these uh, trapped nests of primitive chondrocytes that can potentially undergo malignant transformation uh, forming these chondrosarcomas. And they, they, they cause local osseous destruction and then compressive neurologic symptoms. And the majority of them uh, are low grade requiring either just observation and or radiation. Uh, if you look at the treatment modalities, the five-year recurrence rates, a combined treatment of surgery and radiation reduces those recurrence rates. Uh, this is a little misleading if you look at radiation alone as this is probably limited to tissue diagnosis uh, and limited tumor, pre-treatment tumor size. Um, and so, but what it does suggest is that maybe patients that are poor surgical candidates uh, that can't undergo surgery, radiation uh, may be a benefit. Uh, and looking at the recurrence rates based upon the, uh, the subtype, the mesenchymal subtype uh, have a much higher recurrence than the conventional. And just looking histologically, these are moderately hypercellular without any nuclear atypia, and they stain for S100, which is a peripheral nerve sheath marker. Uh, but they're negative for keratins and brachiuri, which we'll see contrast to the chordomas. And so chordomas are, as we know, they're these malignant neoplasms of notochordal differentiation. There's really four subtypes, conventional, chondroid, portal, and D-differentiated. Uh, and what, we, what they've identified in certain familial cases and in the sporadic cases that involves a T-box gene, uh, which encodes the transcription factor brachiuri, which is essential for notochordal development. And because they derive from the notochord, their presentation is midline, so involving the clivus and the sacrum. And for whatever reason, they have a higher incidence uh, with males compared to females and increasing incidence with age. And their histologic appearance is much more lobulated. Uh, and then they have these uh, characteristic cells, the physoliferous cells, which is just Greek for bubbly, where they lose a cytoplasmic staining but they do have strong nuclear expression of brachiuri. And so the mutation involving this gene, the brachiuri is initially discovered uh, in mice that develop short tails. So, so that's the term brachy. And so prior to our understanding of this, uh, of this transcription factor, it's difficult to di really differentiate the, the chondroid chordoma subtypes from the chondrosarcomas, which have clinical, different clinical outcomes. Um, and brachiuri is essential for the notochordal development as the uh, migratory cells leave the primitive streak and they undergo this epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. And that transformation is a cause of brachiuri. And so if you look at the six to eight week old embryo, as the notochordal, uh, as the notochord regresses, the developing somites, segmental somites lose the expression of brachiuri if you have a remnant of the notochord, they stand exclusively for brachiuri. And this is just showing, this is a heat map just demonstrating that 
chordoma stain exclusively, exclusively for cytokeratins and brachiuria compared to the chondrosarcomas. And moreover, they found that within familial cases of chordomas and sporadics, the T-box gene is still implicated, implicated in the pathogenesis. So really brachiuria is the only identifiable target for these tumors. And so with increasing immunotherapy, uh, they've attempted to create vaccines that have targeted uh, this factor. And so in preclinical trials, uh, using a yeast vaccine, uh, they were able to demonstrate that they actually do light the CD8 positive T cells that are specific for brachiuria do lice chordoma cell lines. Uh, what they, in clinical trials, there's no overall clinical response. And they actually identify that these patients already have CD8 positive T cells that are specific for it. So they don't have uh, much therapeutic benefit at this time. So really what they're doing now is using molecular targets uh, sort of as a shotgun approach for, real, for aggressive and recurrent tumors. Uh, unfortunately, the clinical response rates with these molecular targets are essentially zero. Um, so still the, the only identifiable, identifiable target is brachiuri so far without much clinical response. So we'll move on to visceral schwannomas, uh, but rather than discussing the, the NF2 uh, genetic mutations, uh, I'll, I'll give more of a historical perspective, um, just to see how far we've come from treating these patients. Uh, and this is uh, one of Cushing's famous monographs, uh, the tumors of the nervous acousticus. And if, for those that have read the manuscript, it's more gonna be a uh, like copy and paste. I was able to get the actual publication, but not in PDF format. So a lot of it's just gonna be scanned uh, uh, pages. Um, but even the forward is packed with information. Uh, as Cushion started to recognize that the diagnostic advancements at the time were far outpacing the surgical techniques. And so as, as he writes here, the time is right for special studies of special tumors in special localities, specifically talking about these uh, acoustics. Uh, but his prescient writing, he, he writes, the future will doubtless see many improvements. So he knew he was just the beginning. And then if you look at uh, who he acknowledges, uh, Louise Eisenhart, who, who, who he quotes as being his secretary, uh, but she'll become one of the preeminent neuropathologists of her time, uh, will be the first uh, female president of uh, ANS. So it really begins with Cushion's recognition that uh, surgeons at the time were really seen as purely technicians and not diagnosticians. Uh, and this likely led to a lack of responsibility on their part for when things didn't go uh, right during surgery or if they didn't discover a tumor at the time of the operation. So at his disposal uh, during the early 1900s, they had the ophthalmoscope, the x-ray, and then the barony chloric tests. Uh, and interestingly, Barony was a Hungarian otologist who actually won the Nobel Prize for his work on the vestibular apparatus in 1914. Uh, but but uh, during World War I, he was actually in a prisoner, a Russian prisoner of war camp uh, when they announced the results. And so it wasn't until the behest of the Swedish government and the Red Cross, it was able to be released in 1916 and actually received the Nobel Prize. Lord. Uh, there have been multiple descriptions of the CPA uh, tumors uh, in the past at the time, but it wasn't really until Cruvelier provided the first exhaustive description of the clinical symptoms uh, leading up to the death and the postmortem analysis identifying the lesion. And this is just his illustration here. Towards the turn of the century, they st also started to have a better understanding of neuroanatomy and the clinical symptoms. And so Freire and Turner at King's College were selectively lesioning uh, cerebellums of monkeys, closing and then observing the clinical results. And it was these animal studies that were crucial for the understanding of the double decusation of the cerebellar tracts, and that's the homolateral symptoms in cerebellar pathology. So really at the turn of the century, uh, Cushion was recognized that the surgical techniques needed to catch up with the diagnostic capabilities. And then a report came out in 1900 uh, that, again, correctly localized the tumor. Uh, and then on postmortem analysis, there was a suggestion that this tumor should have been removed. And so with that, here comes Harvey Cushing uh, with his two series looking at acoustic neuromas. And so it's really composed of the Baltimore series from 1902 to 1912 and the Boston series from 1912 to 1917. 
And because pathology at the time wasn't able to identify all the tumors, he only in included uh, verifiable acoustics. And so of those uh, 30 uh, were included in the series, 10 from Baltimore and 20 in Boston. And as he writes, uh, the reading of each of these case reports is not interesting, um, but that in and of itself is the repetition and shows how characteristic and unmistakable the symptoms of these tumors are. And so bear with me as we uh, sort of copy and paste in these pictures. I just wanted to go over some of the early techniques that he started to develop in the mentality of Cushing at the time um, and some of the techniques that have really been passed down from generations through neurosurgical training. And so as he writes, uh, as he recalls uh, his very first operation, um, it brings up a picture of the patient's head insecurely held by an assistant, the anesthetic uh, awkwardly administered, and an inexperienced operator attempting to expose the cerebellum in a wobbly and bloody field. And so subsequently, after that first case, he realized that he needed something to assist with the positioning. So he developed this outrigger with uh, a table, shoulder harnesses, and a headrest, and then the, uh, the ether machine at the head of the table. And at the outset, he, he acknowledges that he had difficulty exposing these tumors. And this is something that we'll, you'll see throughout the cases, this uh, uh, failure to disclose the tumor at the time of the operation. Uh, and so this is one of the first few patients uh, that he experienced, experienced uh, respiratory arrest during surgery. And as it occurred, they institute artificial respiration by Schaefer's method, where the patient maintains the position and they just do thoracic compressions from behind uh, to, to help augment uh, respirations. And what he does at the time is he carries his incision down to the frame and magnum to decompress the cerebellum and release CSF. And this is some of the early techniques that probably were utilized before, but really uh, seen during his time as, as public, this became more public and widespread in training. And it's something that he'll utilize throughout the series. In regards to anesthesia, they didn't use endotracheal anesthesia because that wasn't popular at the time, um, but it was available, but he didn't prefer it because he wanted patients to be on the table in the prone position before any, any anesthesia administered to make sure that they're comfortable um, during the surgery. Uh, early on in his uh, series, he started to have some promising results with subtotal resections. And so by the end of, his uh, end of his Baltimore series, he started to get a little more aggressive. And so the next three cases that he describes uh, resulted in operative fatalities as a result of aggressive surgical resection, probably with some questionable techniques. Uh, as he says, bleeding from vessels on surface of the tumor, incomplete digital nucleation, hemorrhage considerable but finally controlled. Now, using the finger was common before this, and this is the only mention of using the finger for resection in, the, in his acoustic series, and it's something that he didn't use after this. Uh, and then if we often hear about um, uh, our mentors talking about uh, accessing uh, CSF to decompress. And so again, uh, he reviews his performance and saying it's a disastrous performance. Hope it's avoided today. At the time, a ventricular puncture uh, um, when an exceedingly tense cerebellum had been exposed was not appreciated. So not only is he going down in the frame of magnet decompressed, but he's now utilizing a needle for ventricular access and leaving that needle in during the surgery uh, for CSF release and, and brain relaxation. Uh, and then during the, um, in, in this case, immediately after surgery, uh, they flipped the patient from a, the prone position to a supine position, and the patient went into immediate respiratory arrest. And he thought there was uh, bleeding within the surgical cavity, so he flipped them back over, uh, and then there was no bleeding in the patient. Um, this was an operative fatality. Um, because of this fatality, he would leave his patients uh, on the table prone after the operation for hours on end to allow the, the anesthesia to wear off because he thought that this was likely uh, a, a relation to uh, a complication arising from anesthesia administration and positioning. Looking at the case it may be related to a PE that was unrecognized at the time, um, but they certainly weren't thinking of that uh, back then. And so because of his uh, uh, multiple operative fatalities, 
uh, this sort of led him to think of um, not achieving gross total resection, just achieving a subtotal resection for all these tumors. Also, the approach, uh, he, he did utilize a, a transcerebellar approach, uh, but he started to see that the clinical symptoms after surgery were very poor. And so at the end of the Baltimore series, uh, he, he stopped using the transcerebellar approach because of this. And so with the Baltimore series coming to an end, he did note a few things that why decompression helps with these patients, uh, specifically with their general pressure symptoms, as he called it, headaches, ataxia, papilledema. Uh, the quoted historical mortality rate at the time was around 70%. And within his Baltimore series, he had a mortality rate of 36%. And we start to see that he's identifying some of the key steps of the procedure, but certainly hasn't mastered the technique. And then at the time, there's still confusion of what these tumors were. Uh, Cushing was frustrating that uh, the pathologist at the time continued to come back with diagnoses of glioma uh, when he knew that these were extraaxial lesions uh, and were not uh, gl gliomas per se. And because he was such a meticulous documenter, he he's observed uh, some of his patients from the Baltimore series uh, as having recurrent symptoms. And so he writes here, with the knowledge that the tumor removal is incomplete, the recollection of the earlier experiences, the necessity of some further intervention in the course of a few years must be expected. So not only is he advancing this, the surgical techniques, but he's also understanding the natural history and, and course of these tumors. But despite his early uh, experience with exposures, he's still having difficulty identifying the tumors. And so here in the first operation, the left recess was disclosed with no tumor identified. Same operation on the right, no tumor identified and he closed. In the second operation, going against his word, he did a transcerebellar approach. And again, no tumor was identified. It wasn't until on the fourth operation that he finally identified a 2.5 centimeter tumor. And I don't know if it's courage to continue to look for these tumors or insanity, uh, or maybe a little bit of both, but he was always self-critical. And so he was trying to understand why he wasn't identifying these tumors. And so what he, what he found is that, what he writes is, that I fear that in many of these cases, the recess explorations have been conducted too high. And so because of this, he started to employ dissection down towards the jugular foramen to identify the lower cranial nerves. Again, these are basic tenets uh, that we utilize today and have been passed through the generations of neurosurgical training. And so after these series, what are some of his general impressions? Uh, well, first, that patients are typically presenting to him with auditory symptoms or hearing loss for about four years. General pressure symptoms, again, headaches, papilledema, ataxia, for about six months to a year. And he quotes them, without any surgery, you can have a life expectancy uh, and discomfort with blindness of six months to one year. But with surgery, you can have life and some vision preservation for three to four years. And with decompression, maybe up to five years. And he knew that results would get better uh, as people continue to operate on these tumors. And so real quickly, what did his uh, operations look like? Well, he describes them as uh, the fence corner of the Gettysburg battlefield called the bloody angle. And so at the time there were descriptions of unilateral approaches and translab approaches to these tumors. But he couldn't imagine a tumor of that small uh, being operated on. And certainly a patient uh, with tumors of such small size would hardly be induced to court an operation of this magnitude with a certainty of facial paralysis. So what he favored was a bilateral suboccipital approach. And actually he modified this to be a T incision to carry it down to the frame and magnum. Uh, and here's his outrigger again uh, with the, the shoulder harnesses and the headrest. Um, and I don't know if Cushion had a sense of humor or not, but he writes from personal tests that can be certified that the position is comfortable enough to favor sleep. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about uh, anesthesia. And he, he writes that the most important factor is the anesthetist. And this is probably, his thinking on this is probably related to his experience as a medical student. Uh, at Harvard, where as a second year medical student, a general surgeon uh, told him to go administer ether to a patient undergoing a hernia repair. And by the time the surgeon came into the operating theater, the patient had died on the table. 
and Cushing uh, was distraught over his inexperience and his improperly administration of the anesthetic. And so this had a profound effect on him uh, and really made him meticulous in every facet of the operating room. And, by the, and with his time at Brigham, he actually develops his own anesthetic chart uh, to be kept for every patient that he operated on. Here's his operative setup with the towels laid out. And this is the standard T incision that he would employ, a wide bilateral incision carried down to the frame of magnum. Uh, and here he's the, again discussing just the necessity of uh, ventricular access with a needle and then wide framing magnum decompression. Uh, he wouldn't take down to C1. He did employ that several times uh, for a really tense cerebellum, but he really talks about how just using a ventricular access uh, re reduces the cerebellar swelling. Uh, this is just a, an illustration of the, the intracapsular dissection and subtotal resection. And then he goes on to talk about the meticulous closure to prevent CSF leaks. Now, specifically in, in this text, he never, he never explicitly talks about closing dura. Um, so it's unclear. I, I don't think he actually closed dura on these cases. It wasn't until his experience uh, when subsequently left to go to France in World War I, where he finally starts to, to talk about dural closure uh, for patients, but those were mainly for penetrating head injuries and not acoustic tumors. How long do these uh, operations last? It never exceeded a three hour period. It's 45 minutes in, 45 minutes out, and the rest was just for tumor dissection. So these cases were not long. He talks about uh, closing layer by layer, fascia, muscle, and skin uh, to avoid a CSF leak. Uh, and he says he's never had a CSF leak in, in his series. And he, he attributes that to the, the dressing that he places on the patients after surgery. And so he places these large hood dressings to immobilize the patient so that uh, he doesn't place any strain on the incision. And these patients are immobilized for 10 to 12 days. And at the end of it, they take it down to remove the sutures. And then as a true surgeon, he says he's never had an infection, never had any meningitis, and never had any CSF leaks. Uh, so that, that mentality also has been carried through uh, the generations of neurosurgery. So at the end, what are some of his key takeaways? Well, he, he required head and shoulder support, so he developed an outrigger. Uh, he doesn't like endotracheal anesthesia, so he continues to operate through artificial respiration if needed. Wide decompression down to frame and magnum, and if needed, C1. Dissect towards the jugular foramen. Partial resection. Prolonged prone position after surgery because he's worried about uh, the flipping to the supine as a, with some type of complication in the anesthetic. post op nasal feedings to reduce uh, pneumonia, probably because the patients are immobilized and probably unable to swallow in the hood dressing that's applied. Avoid the transvelar approach and requiring a ventriculostomy. And so how did he do? Well, the historical rates, uh, the mortality at the time were around 70%. And by the time he was done at Boston, uh, he reduced that down to 11%. Uh, and the takeaway is that you can expect a three-year period from the general pressure symptoms before they return. And he knew the incomplete resection that he would be seeing these patients back. But unquestionably for these most difficult tumors, he writes, far better operative returns may in the future be expected from our own and other clinics. And so these are the charts that really Dr. Eisenhart uh, kept uh, for Dr. Cushing, uh, his patients and then just the clinical symptoms. And then from Cushing, we'll go on to Dandy, uh, who had, uh, was a big proponent of extensive aggressive resections and taking that upfront risk to reduce the long-term occurrence. And then we'd further refine the surgery of schwannomas with, uh, with Dr. House with the introduction of the microscope. And interestingly, Dr. House was a dental officer in the United States Navy from 46 to 48. So just more, more military influence of the uh, nurse surgery. Uh, so just real quick, we'll, we'll, we'll go over uh, vestibular schwannomas, um, but I won't, won't beat it to death here. Um, the majority of them are sporadic uh, and the majority of those harbor the NF2 and inactivating mutations. Uh, and the uh, pathomotic findings of the Antony A and Antony B and peripheral nerve sheets and then the varicate bodies. 
Uh, these are just the C CNS guidelines for screening. I'll skip over these real quick, just for sake of time. And we're just wanting to look at the pathology here. So the, probably the reason why they're having such difficulty identifying uh, or coming up with a diagnosis based on histology back then was because there's really these two different cellular architects, architectures within the specimen itself. And it wasn't until 1920 that a Swedish uh, neurologist, Dr. Antoni, discovered and, and published his findings on these two distinct uh, areas within the tumor. And the Antoni A and Antoni B, um, it's, it's probably uh, Antoni A regions uh, tend to have a burnout and then they form the Antoni B. And at, at that progression of the burnout, you get the sharp demarcation of uh, the specimens. And interestingly, the varicate bodies are more predominantly seen in spinal schwannomas uh, than vestibular schwannomas. And it may be that the Antoni B with these microcystic regions that they coalesce and they may, may form larger macrocystic cysts that we see during surgery uh, and on MRIs. And so really over the past hundred years, we've seen this transition from a rudimentary understanding of this tumor based on location, uh, improved knowledge of location and histology. And we've really gone from a life vision preservation to a facial hearing uh, preservation. Um, and it's, it was interesting to, re to review his cases because we don't really see that typical presentation that Cushing saw back then. Um, and so the, now the dilemma is uh, hearing preservation. And so the question always comes up, what do you do with an incidentally found in severe schwannoma uh, with, without any brainstem compression, which is identified on a routine workup? from ASIM sensor neuro hearing loss or tinnitus. And if you go back and, and look at the, the, the quotes from some of the uh, uh, older surgeons, it's probably an apt description of how we should view these. So if you look at the treatment options, radiation, surgery, and observation, sure in the short run, surgery looks to, looks to have worse outcomes. But if you carry that five, 10 years, uh, radiation observation essentially have the same outcome with decreased hearing loss uh, uh, over 10 years, but you see a plateau with surgery. And so in the words of Glasscock, uh, who is a, a mentor or is a pupil under house, we should not simply quote the literature when counseling our patients regarding the rate of success or complication with surgery, but it's our responsibility to track and know our own outcomes. And this was further emphasized in a, in a review in the early 2000s, looking at uh, high volume centers with severe schwannomas. And they concluded that the surgical team accounted for more variability in the hearing preservation than the actual surgical approach. And then you go all the way back to Cushing, and he says stats regarding the results of brain tumor operations in general are deceptive and can be made to prove almost anything the author desires, no, no matter how honest he may be. Uh, so uh, that was my big takeaway from reviewing Cushing's uh, series and, and the most recent retrospective reviews is that really need to, to look at our own uh, results uh, when counseling these patients. And so that, we'll turn our, our attention to meningiomas um, and we'll discuss more of the molecular characteristics underlying these that have uh, really come to fruition in the past decade. So these are the most common CNS tumors in adults uh, and they really the only environmental exposure is with ionizing radiation and then the associated NF2 and Gorlin syndromes. And so Cushing published another landmark paper or publication in 1938 on meningiomas. And during this intervening period between the publication of, the, of Simpson's paper, uh, there was controversy in regards to the frequency and significance of these re of recurrences. Because in Cushing's paper, he never uh, quoted his recurrence rate. It was upwards probably of 15 to 20%. And so Simpson came along and, and wanted to identify what the, what the significance was and whether the recurrence was related to the intrinsic malignancy of the tumors or inadequacy of surgery. And so this is a Simpson grading scale that we all utilize even today, grade one through five. And so based upon his series and then a, another series in London, Cushing series, and then a significant series in Sweden from Olive Krona, who is the founder of uh, neurosurgery in Sweden, uh, they looked at the, the incidence of recurrence based on location, uh, extent of resection, and histology. And so if you look at the, the extent of resection based on site, uh, you see that there's an increased risk of recurrence with skull base, uh, 
And then if you, there's an increased risk of recurrence based on from grade one to grade two. Um, and then as a side note, uh, just looking at techniques that we utilize today and understanding of where we get information from, uh, the, the idea that we can take the anterior one third of a sinus with these parasitical meningiomas really comes from the Swedish case report uh, where Olive Corona operated on 143 parasitical uh, meningiomas. And it was in his publication that he says that when the sinus is obstructed, the entire sinus may be resected on block, but when there is flow, only a third of the anterior sinus may be resected. Uh, so looking at the extent of resection with grade ones in this series, there's eight recurrences, grade two, there's 18, and grade three, there's 20, co combination of grade three and four, there's 27 recurrences. So essentially the conclusion was that the risk of recurrence is related to the extent of resection. Uh, and then they, they did start to incorporate histology, um, but there wasn't any conclusive results in that. Maybe there is some relation, um, but that's still where we are today. We're still trying to identify certain tumor characteristics that have a prognostic value. And so why is that important? Well, for some of these tumors, uh, it's pretty easy. So these small convexity meningiomas that are either found incidentally or pre present with seizures, surgery is likely the cure for these patients. But it gets a little more complicated when you have patients that have already undergone multiple resections, rounds of chemotherapy, radiation, wound breakdown requiring a free flap. The surgical planning uh, is significant and, and surgery probably isn't the cure for these, these tumors. There's gotta be something else. And what about in this patient with large petroclival meningiomas, bilateral serenoid wing, multiple parasagittal tumors, we can operate and we do, and the surgical planning again is exhausting. Um, and you have to plan for multiple rounds of surgeries, complications, and these are morbid operations on these patients. But we can achieve great, great surgical results in these patients, um, but he's only 20 years old. So he's gonna recur. There's gotta be another treatment for him other than just surgery and radiation. Or what about these tumors? these extensive skull-based tumors or, or syndromic patients with large tumor burdens that you can't operate on every single large tumor uh, in, this, in this person's body. So, so what's next? And so really the, over the past decade, they've, they started to identify that tumor locations um, is strongly associated with these molecular alterations. And so the most recent classifications that is coming out um, with, from uh, the WHO classifications incorporates these molecular diagnostics. And there's some new changes that will be coming out, including switching to Arabic numerals uh, and then some new tumors, but nothing involving uh, the meningioma spectrums. And so, and so what's the point of all this? Well, really it's, it's so that we can identify patients with early tumor occurrence so that we can individualize their treatment. So based on the 2016 uh, grading, it's just, grade one, two, and three based on histology. Now the newest classification is gonna incorporate uh, not only molecular diagnostics, uh, but you're gonna be able to classify uh, all tumors uh, within each classification. So just because you have a meningothelial subtype, that doesn't just make it a who grade one. That can be reclassified as who grade two or who grade three. Um, and so, there's really two drivers of, uh, of these meningiomas. There's an NF2 driven pathway and then a non NF2 driven pathway. Um, and so, so we'll go through each one, each one of these uh, quickly. The NF2 driven pathway with the biallelic loss uh, of NF2 results in the loss of the protein Merlin, um, which connects uh, membrane proteins to the cytoskeleton necessary for signal transduction, cell growth and proliferation. And loss of Merlin really loss, uh, results in a loss of contact mediated inhibition. Uh, and the frequency of NF2 mutations among all these subtypes is, is roughly equal. So it's likely an, an initiation of tumor genesis and not necessarily associated with malignant transformation. Uh, going through the non-NF2 pathways, uh, it looks a little bit like alphabet soup with these, uh, these genes, but um, I try to understand where the name comes from. So. In the early 2000s, Lewis Cantley, who's a famous cellular biologist uh, with Cornell, identified this protein AKT1 involved with the PI3K pathway. And this is 
and now uh, implicated in many, many cancers, not just meningiomas, but it's, it's connected all these different signal transduction pathways. And so AKT1, the AK is the mouse strain that this gene was identified and the T is the thy thymomas that develop in these mouse strains. So AKT1 is basically uh, just associated with phosphor phosphorylation of these uh, growth factors and increasing signal transduction. Um, TRAF7, uh, TNF receptor associated factor seven uh, is associated uh, with upregulation of uh, PDL1. So in meningiomas and in other tumors, there's this idea there's an immunosuppressed state uh, where the tumor is evading the host immune response. And so this oncogenic mutation involving TRAF7 upregulates PDL1, program ligand uh, or program ligand, program death ligand one. And so it does this by uh, leading to an unregulated activation of nuclear factor uh, there is, that binds to the promoter region of PDL1, leading to upregulation. Kruppel like factor four, KL4. Kruppel just means crippled in German for uh, the appearance of the Drosophila larvae when they identify this mutation. Uh, so KL4 is another important transcription factor. Uh, and this leads to increased VEGF concentrations. And it does this by blocking the specific degradation of hypoxia inducible factor by the von Hippel Lindau protein. And so, just as you see VEGF, increased VEGF concentrations in gliomas, you also see them in meningiomas and specifically associated with secretory meningiomas. The last one we'll briefly review is the SMO or the smoothened seven span transmembrane protein. And this is intimately involved with the hedgehog pathway which has a big role in midline patterning in the embryo. Uh, and because it's involved in the hedgehog pathway, uh, these tumors are, are mainly found in the midline and specifically olfactory groove meningiomas. And so now that you start to see this picture where um, certain molecular characteristics can predict tumor locations. And so now they're starting to incorporate that into grading classifications. And so this is just a, pro, just a flow chart looking at the mutation profiles of meningiomas. That typically, we're gonna start seeing this in more of the tumors. We already saw in gliomas in the, the earliest uh, WHO classifications. Um, I've ident identified multiple genetic alterations that are associated with higher grade tumors. And this is just a pictorial representation of where these tumors are located based on the mutation spectrum. So typically NF2 mutated tumors are, are mainly on like convexity and parasagittal. And then with the addition of the smart b one mutation, which is associated with just a chromatin remodeling complex, uh, they found that those are mainly uh, associated, those tumors associated with that are anterior to the coronal suture. Uh, and then the rest of the mutations are typically just of the skull base. So NF2, mainly convexity, the, the, the non-NF2 pathogenesis pathways uh, related to the skull base. And so really, it took 20 years for Simpson to really look at the extent of resection from, from Cushing's uh, first publication. And it's taken us 65 years to develop and to enhance upon Simpson's classification. And so if you break out the progression-free survival curves of uh, these tumors based on the molecular subtypes, you start to see that there's a, a break point and there's a difference in some of these tumors. Maybe the TRAF7 and Spark V1 having lower progression free survival compared to the other ones. And again, this is just a time uh, graph looking at recurrence based on molecular subtype. And so maybe there, there's an increased risk of recurrence with some of these subtypes compared to others. And so if you create a new classification, uh, people are grading these nomograms based on these molecular alterations. Uh, and so again, it's great, uh, another classification system for tumors, but it's probably what they're trying to do is they're trying to integrate it with the WHO classification. Unfortunately, if you look at the, these new classification systems and you compare it to the WHO classifications, about 30% of the tumors can be reclassified. And so if you look at these progression-free survival curves, those that have, those tumors that have brain invasion, so WHO grade two or three tumors, if you, if you reclassify them into the integrated grade one by their molecular subtype, you see a different progression-free survival profile compared to those that are reclassified as grade two or three. And stated another way, who grade two, three tumors that are reclassified 
have a different profile than who grade one tumors that were reclassified into a higher grade. And not only are we looking at molecular alterations, we're looking at epigenetics as well. So methylation profiles are gonna become a, a thing with these classification systems. For now, the methylation profiles are, are mainly binary. They're either in a high risk group or a low, low risk group, uh, but nevertheless incorporating is gonna enhance our understanding and, and predictability of these tumors. And so there's plenty of ongoing trials uh, looking at these specific molecular targets, um, but they're, they're not broken up into different molecular subtypes. And so it's gonna be interesting to, to look at these results and likely have to do some retrospective studies uh, to actually break them up to see if based on their molecular subtype, if there's improved outcomes in some of the studies. And so in the last couple of minutes, I'll touch on craniopharyngiomas uh, real quick, uh, just to save some time. So craniopharyngiomas come in two, two subtypes, adamantinomatous and papillary. Uh, and they both arise from the craniopharyngeal duct, but they have two distinct uh, oncogenic mutations. And so you, you can consider these as two separate tumors because of the different pathways that they, they arise from. So the adamantinomatous is associated with beta catenin or the WNT signaling pathway. And these present in a bimodal distribution, but predominantly in children, whereas papillaries are almost exclusively in adults. Uh, I'll skip this really, and I'll just briefly talk about the, the pathogenesis of the adamantinomatous subtype, because this is really distinct uh, and rather unique uh, in, in uh, tumor genesis. And so within craniopharyngiomas, all tumor, all the tumor cells have this clonal mutation of beta catenin involving the WNT pathway. Uh, but not all those tumors go on to uh, proliferation. It's only the tumors that are around these senescent clusters. And so these senescent clusters uh, formed from early primitive pituitary stem cells that continue to harbor a transcription factor uh, that allows them to for, form these cell clusters. And these cell clusters, they, they don't grow, they have a low, they have a low KI index, uh, but they secrete these growth uh, factors and hormones in a paracrine fashion to cause uh, surrounding cells to initiate proliferation. And so if you look at immunohistochemical stains of craniopharyngiomas, you'll see um, the beta catenin uh, with nuclear translocation at the periphery of the tumors where it's associated with the cytoplasm in the middle of the tumors. And so that they, they think that this paracrine signaling is associated with the, the invasiveness of craniopharyngiomas. And so one of the therapies that will be coming through the pipeline is anti senescent drugs to see if you can stop the cellular proliferation by turning off these paracrine signaling. Uh, with papillary craniopharyngiomas, they identified uh, BRAF mutations uh, and really demonstrated a dramatic result in, this, in single patients that really started uh, thinking of for these treatments for molecular targeting for these papillary patients. And so this patient, the first patient to undergo this treatment had four or five resections within like a 12 month period for this aggressive recurrent papillary tumor. And they identified a BRAF mutation. And so they actually targeted uh, that BRAF mutation within four days of initiating treatment, uh, they started to see tumor regression. And by a month, the tumor had completely regressed and remained uh, sh or showed progression free uh, up to seven months after initiating uh, treatment. So that led to this phase two trial looking at uh, targeted BRAF uh, therapy for patients with papillary craniopharyngiomas. Uh, in the last couple minutes, I'll, I'll skip uh, this operative anatomy section um, and just briefly talk about um, Walter Reed. Unfortunately, I know Dr. Ellenbogen is uh, not here, um, but I'll, I'll continue with this uh, either way. Walter Reed has a rich history of neurosurgery uh, in the military as well. And it's probably more history than I have time here. Uh, but some of the, the fathers of modern day uh, military neurosurgery included Rizzoli, uh, who was, I, I think he was Dandy's last resident, uh, but he clipped the first pica aneurysm at Walter Reed. Uh, and then Kempe, um, which I'm glad to see that the Kempe incision is still alive and well and utilized today. Uh, and then th these are uh, 
Rizzoli and Horowitz who were prominent DC neurosurgeons. Um, but then uh, Dr. Ellenbogen, who was chairman of Walter Reed from 95 to 98. Uh, and he actually oversaw the integration of the army residency at Walter Reed and the naval residency at the Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. And it was under his leadership that they combined programs so that we had one neurosurgical program within the military. Uh, and I think this, I, I got these from my uh, prior fellowship director, Dr. Armanda. I think this is Dr. Ellenbogen's uh, promotion ceremony to Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and I grew my mustache out uh, sort of in, to, as a tribute uh, to the prior military neurosurgeons, but strikingly a similar appearance with, uh, with Dr. Ellenbogen. So uh, when he gets back, I'll have to show him these slides. So Walter Reed opened in 1909, uh, but unfortunately uh, at the direction of Congress, there was a base realignment and closure act in 2012. And so Walter Reed is no longer uh, it is now, I think, high-rise condominiums, uh, but everything's transitioned over to the National Naval Medical Center. And this was renamed the Walter Reed National Naval Military Medical Center. And that's where I did my residency. And at the completion of this fellowship, uh, I'll be returning to Walter Reed, uh, hoping to continue the longstanding legacy of excellence in military neurosurgery um, that was really solidified under Dr. Ellen Logan's leadership in the 90s. A um, couple minutes left. Um, I just want to thank everyone here. Uh, uh, and so I hope to take my experience here uh, in the name of University of Washington and bring that same quality uh, of care back to Walter Reed so that uh, veterans and active duty members and their dependents can have that same level of comfort uh, in their care uh, when I go back to Walter Reed. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank everyone for my time. I know I have many months left in my fellowship, uh, but I'm starting to see the end. So uh, thank you and 